excited. VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and Dan Novak. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. An American diplomat has warned the Taliban that its military campaign to control Afghanistan will not result in a government that is recognized internationally. The diplomat, Zalmay Khalilzad, gave the warning Tuesday to Taliban representatives in Doha, Qatar. The Taliban has a political office in Doha. Khalil Zad has led U.S. peace efforts related to Afghanistan for several years. He and others hope to persuade Taliban leaders to return to peace talks with the Afghan government. But the Taliban has intensified military efforts in recent weeks to take control of wide areas of the country. The group's new campaign followed the U.S. decision last month to end its military activities in Afghanistan by the end of August. Most recently, Taliban fighters captured six out of 34 provincial capitals in less than one week. They included Kunduz, one of the country's largest cities in Kunduz province. The Taliban is now battling the Western-backed Afghan government for control of several other provinces in the south. On Tuesday, Taliban forces entered Farah and were seen in front of the provincial governor's office. The fighting has driven thousands of people to Kabul, where many are living in open areas in the city. The latest Taliban gains have led to new efforts to restart peace talks aimed at ending the fighting. The goal is to begin a process to create an agreement for a power-sharing government. The Taliban has so far refused to return to peace negotiations. The new pressure from Khalilzad follows condemnation of the Taliban's moves by the international community. The United Nations has also warned the Taliban that any government that takes power by force will not be recognized. The U.S. State Department said in a statement Khalilzad's mission in Qatar is meant to help formulate a joint international response to the current situation. The diplomat plans to press the Taliban to stop their military offensive and to negotiate a political settlement, the statement said. The Taliban's military chief released an audio message to his fighters on Tuesday, the Associated Press reported. The message ordered the fighters not to harm Afghan forces or government officials in territories they seize. The five-minute message was recorded by Mohammad Yaqub, son of the late Taliban leader Mullah Mohammad Omar. 
It instructed the rebels to stay out of empty homes belonging to government officials, to leave marketplaces open, and to protect places of business, including banks. It remains unclear, however, whether Taliban fighters would obey the orders. Some civilians who have fled Taliban forces have said they had put repressive restrictions on women and burned down schools. The office of the UN Human Rights Chief said it has received reports of executions, revenge killings, and military use and destruction of homes, schools, and medical centers. Many civilians have been killed or injured in the fighting. The UN Human Rights Chief, Michelle Bachelet, said Tuesday her office had counted at least 183 deaths and hundreds of injured among civilians in several cities in recent weeks. I'm Brian Lynn. Research on national test scores suggests that students' learning greatly slowed down last year because of the pandemic. Minority and poorer students suffered the most. Research published last week by the Center for Reinventing Public Education, or CRPE, argues there is major evidence that student progress in math and reading slowed by several months. The paper collected information from 12 different reports on student test scores during the pandemic. The CRPE study says that the average student is behind academically compared to students from previous years. The study points to school closures and remote learning as the main reasons behind the decline. Robin Lake is one of the authors of the study. She wrote in a tweet last week that a large number of American students have learned very little in core subjects this year failed classes at high rates, and been absent or missing from their schools. There is little doubt that, on average, more in-person instruction produced more learning, she wrote. Another study, released last month by the Education Research Group, NWEA, looked at end-of-year success relative to a normal school year. Looking at national test scores, NWEA found that students made progress in math and reading in the 2020-2021 school year, but that progress was much slower than in past years. Students especially struggled in math. NWEA found that students finished the 2020 to 2021 school year 8 to 12 percentile points lower than students in past years. The findings come as the Delta variant of the coronavirus threatens school reopening plans. Educators and experts agree that in-person schooling should be a top concern. But more children who are not able to get vaccinated are getting sick with the highly contagious and more dangerous form of the virus. 
one third of school districts in the country are not requiring masks this school year, and another third have not made any decision on masks, says the publication Education Week. Miguel Cardona is the head of the U.S. Department of Education. Speaking to reporters last week, he said he was worried about adult actions getting in the way of schools safely reopening. Let our educators educate. Let our school leaders lead. Let's not go back to the school system of March 2020. Exactly who was learning in person? At the beginning of 2021, varied greatly based on race. Federal data found that in January, 27 percent of white fourth graders were learning online, but 58 percent of black students and 56 percent of Hispanic students were taking online classes. That difference in in-person learning may have added to the widening of the achievement gap between mostly white and higher-income students, and mostly minority and lower-income students during the last school year. In math, students in majority black schools. Ended the year with six months of unfinished learning. Students in low-income schools with seven, said a study of student test scores by McKinsey, released in July. NWEA's research also showed that low-income and minority schools suffered the biggest drops in reading and math. Test scores. The pandemic exacerbated pre-existing inequities in educational opportunities and outcomes. The study said. Many of the students who were lower already showed the biggest drops, said Megan Kufeld in an interview with Education Week. Kufeld is one of the authors of the NWEA study. That's very alarming to me. Education experts argue that more assistance is needed for low-income schools that were hurting long before the pandemic. President Joe Biden's administration had proposed a one hundred billion dollar increase. To improve school facilities as a part of his infrastructure plan, little funding for schools, however, remains in the one trillion dollar bipartisan bill currently being debated in the U.S. Senate. The CRPE study argues that the recent research shows the impact of the pandemic is short term. And that student learning can be improved upon, but Lake said a return to what was normal for many low-income schools may not be enough to prevent long-term declines in learning. The answer to the question "How much will they suffer long-term?" depends on adult action, Lake said in a tweet. What we do from here matters. I'm Dan Novak. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites: 
the World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in Special English. I'm Steve Ember. In May of 1787, a group of America's early leaders met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to amend the Articles of Confederation. That document established a loose union of the 13 states. Instead, the leaders wrote a completely new constitution. They created America's system of government and recognized the rights of its citizens. Last week, we discussed the way the delegates agreed that states would be represented in the national government. There would be two houses in the legislature. In one house, the House of Representatives, the number of representatives from each state would depend on the state's population. In the other house, the Senate, all states would have an equal number of representatives. The Agreement on Representation was known as the Great Compromise. Not all the delegates in Philadelphia were pleased with it, but it saved the convention from failure. The debate on representation in the House raised an important issue. No one wanted to talk about it, but all the delegates knew they had to discuss it. The issue was slavery. There were thousands of slaves in the United States in 1787. Most of them were in southern states. But there were many slaves in the north, too. And northern ship owners made a lot of money by importing slaves from Africa. A modern-day Supreme Court justice, Clarence Thomas, came from a family whose ancestors included slaves. Justice Thomas says slavery made no sense in America. How can you have a free country with slaves? We understood that. It's a contradiction. It contradicts the very founding premise of the country. The Articles of Confederation said nothing about slavery. Each state could decide to allow it or not. Massachusetts, for example, made slavery illegal. Nine other states stopped importing new slaves. Only three states, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, continued to import slaves. The issue was never easy to discuss. Some of the most important men in America, including George Washington and James Madison, owned slaves. No one wanted to insult these men, yet the delegates at the convention had to make some decisions about slavery. Slavery affected laws on trade and taxes, as well as the question of representation in Congress. If the number of representatives in the House was based on a state's population, who would you count? Would you count just free people, or would you count slaves too? Akil Reed Amar a professor of law and political science at Yale University, calls slavery the original sin of America's founders. They inherited it, to be sure, and, uh, and they worried about it, but not enough. During the 
the debate, some delegates argued that slaves were property and should not be counted for purposes of representation. Others argued that slaves were people and should be counted with everyone else. Governor Morris of Pennsylvania made an angry speech. He denounced slavery as an evil institution. Charles Pinckney of South Carolina defended the existence of slavery in the United States. In all ages, he said, one half of mankind have been slaves. George Mason of Virginia, a slave owner, wanted to free all slaves. He said Virginia attempted to do that when it was a British colony, but that the British government refused. He blamed the problem on British businessmen who made money from slavery. Other delegates rose to denounce or defend slavery. But no one at the convention had the power to rule on whether slavery was right or wrong. Everyone knew the convention would fail if they tried to write a constitution that banned slavery. The southern states would never accept it they would refuse to be part of the United States. Rufus King of Massachusetts said, the convention should consider slavery only as a political matter. And that was what happened. The delegates accepted several political compromises on the issue. James Wilson of Pennsylvania, for example, proposed a method of counting each state's population for purposes of representation. All white people and other free citizens would be counted as one person each. Every five slaves would be counted only as three people. This was called the three-fifths rule. The delegates accepted it. The word slave was never used in the Constitution. The document simply used the words all other persons. The three-fifths rule remained the law until the 14th Amendment to the Constitution came into effect in 1868. Alexander Hamilton said the three-fifths compromise was necessary. Without it, he said, no union could possibly have been formed. Slavery also became an issue when the delegates began discussing the powers of the national legislature. Once again, the delegates asked, are slaves people or are they property? The answer would affect import taxes and the growth of new states. The delegates accepted several compromises on these questions, too. They agreed that the Treasury could collect a tax of $10 for every imported slave. They also agreed that slaves could be imported until 1808. Then, no new slaves could be brought into the country. Until then... Each state had the power to make its own decisions about slavery. After 1808, the national government would make all the decisions. 
Constitutional law professor Akhil Reed Amar says that agreement is where the delegates went wrong. What was the founders' biggest mistake? Not that they didn't get rid of slavery immediately. It was already a part of their world. It would have been difficult to get rid of slavery immediately. But what they didn't do is come up with a long-term plan to get rid of slavery eventually. Debate on the Constitution continued through the summer of 1787. At the same time, some of the delegates raised an important question. Once the document was written, who would approve it? The state legislatures? The people? Or, as Governor Morris proposed, one big national convention? Elbridge Gerry opposed giving that power to the people. The people, he said, have the wildest ideas of government in the world. James Madison disagreed. He believed the people must ratify their new plan of government. Madison considered the difference between a system founded on the legislatures only and one founded on the people to be the true difference between a league or treaty and a constitution. When the debate was over, the delegates agreed that the people should ratify the new constitution through conventions held in each state. Justice Clarence Thomas and law professor Akhil Reed Amar have described this agreement as one of the most remarkable parts of the convention. You think of the going to Washington and trying to get him to leave Mount Vernon, and he doesn't want to leave because he's finally back home. He'd been away over four years, and he doesn't want to leave. And he goes to Philadelphia, and they do it. They come up with this document, what, four months, and now you have it. It's going to the Congress, and it's going to be sent to the people to... To the people. To the people, Amazing. to ratify. Amazing. Finally, the delegates had to decide how many yes votes by states would be needed to ratify the Constitution. Any changes to the Articles of Confederation needed ratification by all 13 states. The Philadelphia Convention was called only to change those articles, not to replace them. So all 13 states would have to approve. But several delegates said this would be impossible. After all, Rhode Island never sent a representative to Philadelphia. That state was sure to reject the Constitution. Also, as everyone knew, the Philadelphia Convention went far past the point of changing the Articles of Confederation. The delegates wrote a completely new plan of government. But that meant they could agree to accept ratification by fewer than 13 states. Delegates who supported a strong central government wanted to quickly put the question to a vote. How many states were needed to ratify? By the end of the day, the convention had not decided. But early the next day, the delegates voted, and the number they agreed on was nine. The convention in Philadelphia was nearing the end of its work. The delegates needed only to write out their agreements in final form and sign the document. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 